Hey, hey, Chris. Can you hey. hear me? Yep. All right. <laughs> hey, hey, welcome back to When the Cleats Come Off. I'm your host, Ashley Burkhart. And my good friend, Chris Basami, is back on the pod. He's been on once, had to have him on again because last week we had a conversation on the phone and there's some stuff with hitting that we were like, we need to get this recorded ASAP. <laughs> but I'm so glad to have you here. No, I'm glad to be back. Thank you for having me. It's always yes. fun. Yes, yes, yes. We, we talk every week about hitting, but now it's time to actually have a mic on listening to this convo. Uh, it is at our regular meeting time that we normally talk anyway, too. So grateful to have you back on the show. We had you on talking about your story of overcoming adversity, um, which is super powerful. It was a huge hit on when the cleats come off. But today we're going to talk all about hitting. Let's do it. Let's do it. So give a refresher to the audience what we were talking about last week that we want to share today. A lot of times when Ashley and I talk, we we talk about our experiences that we are seeing on our own on a weekly basis, things that we are going through personally, things that we are going through with our athletes and it is June 29th. So last week when we talked, it was June 22nd. So here in North Carolina right now, um, kids have been out of school for about a month. They are entrenched in their summer seasons, travel, whatever age it is. Um, and what gets me a lot of times is, especially with the high school kids, they have these goals of, I want to play in college, or I want to be noticed, or I want to be able to be seen. And so it's summertime. It is baseball season. And kids who feel, who have not earned anything yet, they have not earned a phone call. They have not earned a email. They have not earned a, hey, I think you can ball out conversation feel like they have earned in some way or another a vacation. And so in the middle of baseball season, softball season, I have players who are decided that they need a week off to go to the beach for whatever reason. And it's not about the week off. It's not about anything other than they feel like they, they have earned it, having earned nothing yet so far. And what gets me is that I always tell my players, you cannot think that you are going to do any less work than anybody who has gotten to where you want to go and still get there. It just doesn't work that way. The blueprint has been laid out for us. It's been laid out that way forever. The only reason why the blueprint might be a little bit different is just because we have social media now. So instead of having to email coaches or have my high school coach or my travel coach make these conversations, I can go on Twitter, I can go on Instagram, and I can go on Facebook and tag everybody I need to tag to show them, hey, I went one for three, or I went two for four, or whatever it is. But still, at the end of the day, I have to put the work in to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And even if I tag Twitter, Instagram, whatever it is, it means nothing. Until you have those conversations, those phone calls, those emails, those in person, those conversations where you can feel like, okay, I'm on the right track. I'm doing what I'm supposed to. It's still just a dream at that point. And so to think that, okay, everything I've done so far is good and I can have a vacation. Um, they just, these players just end up kind of fooling themselves. And then what ends up happening is when they don't achieve their goals, a lot of times they want to blame everything else other than looking inside and understanding, wait, did I really do everything I possibly could have? Yeah. Um, and so that sparked conversation with us. Uh, we talked about some ex experiences we've had and some very concrete examples. And that just kind of get us going into the idea of, well, there, there must be some other myths out there that, that kids think and players think that um, if they do it, then it just leads to automatic success. Yeah. And I want to let the audience know too, we're not talking about eight-year-olds. We're not talking about 10-year-olds. 
Like, it's great if they want to go play in college at 10, but here's the deal. That age is meant to have fun and enjoy the game and play a bunch of other sports and learn how to be a good athlete. We're talking about the kids who are in high school that they don't understand what it does take to, to get to the highest level because they want to be there. Like, we have been there. Um, I guess we should probably do a little bit of a spiel. Like, I want you to introduce yourself to those people who maybe didn't listen to the first episode um, because we're both former college and pro athletes, but I want the audience to get to know you a little bit more before we dive into these myths that we're talking about. Yeah, so full name is Chris Vasami. I was born and raised in Mamertic, New York, uh, just outside New York City. I was a two-time All-American in high school. I went to Notre Dame out of high school. Uh, I then transferred to Elon, uh, got drafted out of Elon. Um, I was an all-conference player at Elon and then got drafted, played four years with the Rockies and a couple years of independent ball. And um, I pitched, I played infield. I, the Rockies made me a catcher. Um, and all the while I was in pro ball. Um, and even before that, when I was in college, I just start, I started Vasami training, started training players, um, really got into understanding how we learn, how we train, um, how we, incorporate everything that makes us who we are as a human being into our training and ever since then i've i've loved training i've loved helping players i've been fortunate enough to help male and female baseball and softball players head to college um, which has been a blast and so my my purpose now my goal is that anybody who comes to me with a goal i try to take all the experience of, that i have had as a player and a teacher and help them achieve their goal and meet them wherever they need to be met. And this is why we're best buddies because we both have that same goal of wanting athletes to be able to pursue whatever it is that they want, which is why this issue was so big to us. And we talked about it for almost an hour. Um, you know, the fact that athletes in high school that have these huge dreams and goals and don't realize that summertime is time to play. Summertime is time to compete and be seen and go to these showcases. And again, we're not talking about 10 year olds, we're talking about these high schoolers that wanna pursue their dream. This is where the grind is. This is not time to vacation. I remember our vacations in the summer was driving to Colorado for the biggest showcase of the year. Um, that was our vacation. And yeah, we had a couple of days where we got to hike and hang out with the team and do some really cool things, but we, we still know we had a job to do. We, our job was to win and our job was to compete. So those people that, you know, want to take their family vacation in the summer, maybe rethink it because now is not the time to do that. And I understand like family schedules, work schedules, they can, they can change. And um, now might be literally the only time of the whole year. And for that, I'm not going to tell anybody how to raise their kids or anything, but if your daughter or son has a goal to be able to compete in college, you can't miss out on the most important part of the year. And that's the summer. No, I mean, what's interesting is that there aren't even leagues anymore, per se. Everything is a, is a, is a three or four day tournament. So you already have these days off already. Monday, mm -hmm. Tuesday, Wednesday is usually a day off. Thursday is travel, make it to the tournament. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday play. When I was in high school, we actually played a full summer season. So it was a single game Monday through Friday, doubleheader Saturday, doubleheader Sunday, June 1st to August 1st. Mm -hmm. There were no days off. Yeah. The, only, the day off was because it rained. That was it. Then after your season, you were trying to navigate a trip to go to a showcase or a trip to go to a, you know, I went to the East Coast Professional Showcase. Then I tried out at the area codes. Then I went out to the area code games. But I almost in a weird way had to ask permission to go to these giant showcases because we technically had a season. And same as you, our one week of vacation a year was the third week of, of August because there was everything was done. Mm -hmm. And even then, because I knew I would have to come back and either head to a showcase or a tournament on Labor Day or whatever it was, I mean, it, it's not like I wasn't doing anything. I had to bring my glove. My dad and I would play catch. We'd, we'd find a cage. We'd, you know, even if it was the old school pitching machine, batting cages, whatever it was, I just feel like in when it comes to hitting specifically, 
we spend so much time creating these feelings and these sensations and trying to find this swing that I can repeat over and over again. I don't know how I can just completely take a week off and not even, because here's the thing, if they were thinking about it or doing shadow swings, I'd say, okay, but we know that's not happening. <laughs> so it really is this complete week off in the middle of the season. Mm -hmm. And then we wonder why when we come, Back, we're not sharp and we didn't do well at the next showcase and then it starts to spiral and who who loves the mental game more than you mm -hmm. and so that mental game starts to spiral because oh no i'm not confident where it's like you're not confident because you took a week off because you took a vacation that you didn't earn in the middle of the season yeah. um so that's how we um that's how we got to where we are right now Totally. And I don't, I totally want to add to every year, my family went on spring break. So this was like right before high school season would start. Um, and my dad would always put my glove in the bat in the car. And yes, there was like one or two days where we'd literally just spend on the beach. He'd throw a ball and I would dive for it, like on the beach. And like, we had fun with it. Like we kept playing. It wasn't as structured as what it was at home, but like we still brought our stuff. And, you know, there was a day where we got to have a couple hours on a field, like we used it. Um, and you know, sometimes that was my dad saying, we're bringing your stuff and not me, but like my dad knew that my goal was to play in college. And so we can't fully take this time off. Um, mm -hmm. and you know, some people that are on the edge of burnout though, I think they, I don't want to say have an excuse, but you know, some athletes, they literally are, are close to burnout and the best thing for them is a break. Um, but that's not most athletes I think that we're no. talking about here. No. But the thing is, though, can you really get burnt out practicing two, three times a week? I don't know. So Sometimes the game gets to people in ways to where they don't want to even think about it. Totally. And I think that, as you said, those are more scarce situations than the norm. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you love doing something and, and the goal is, is bigger than you can really even imagine it is, then... If you think you've done enough, do more. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So this leads us to the fact that we want to talk about some myths. So we've come up with a list, you and I, of five myths, five hitting myths that I think the majority of people in our sport, and I yes, I say baseball and softball is a, our sport, mm -hmm. they are living and dying off of these myths, and we need to debunk them right now. Yeah. All right. Let's start with this one because we're already talking about it almost. I can train one time a week and see good results. Debunk this one, Chris. If you define training as training with my, my hitting coach, and if you're relying on the 30 minutes or 45 minutes or 60 minutes a week with that training coach, and the other 167 hours of the week, we're not really focused on what we did with our hitting coach, how I want to take what I did with my hitting coach and spread it out throughout the week and then build on what we've done with my hitting coach. You will see progress the day after, and then you will slowly go back down to where you were the day before you met your training coach, mm -hmm. rinse and repeat cycle all over again. Yep. Your train, your, the training with your coach, it's no different than me training at the gym, working with a nutritionist, whatever it is, that is to build the pot of knowledge. And when you have that pot of knowledge, if things are brewing and things are stewing, then we should always be able to understand and go back to it. And so you, but to keep a pot brewing, you have to have a flame. And so that flame has to constantly be burning. And so I can't sit there as a player and on Monday have a huge flame and on Thursday or Friday, it's starting to damper. And then on Sunday it's gone. And then, okay, I meet my training coach again. And now all of a sudden it's sparked. Like at some point it's not going to happen because if you're training, if your coach or your hitting coach is 
is as good as they should be, they're going to tell you right away, guys, like I care more than you at this moment and I can't do that. Mm -hmm. And so if we really think that that one time a week is enough, that's a huge problem that needs to be addressed. Absolutely. And I'm going to shout out Scott Burkhardt here because he taught me this amazing thing when I was younger and didn't understand the purpose of it until today. And yeah, maybe I was 25 when I learned this, but I had one of the best hitting coaches in Indiana, like straight up. We drove two hours to go see her every single week. So I could, so we could learn from her and gain knowledge that we didn't already, we didn't have. And that's why it was worth the two hours. So we'd go there every single week. And my dad was like, we need to make the most of this money because like travel ball, the expenses that you're already putting in, like what a waste if we would have just gone there and only, and the only time I hit would have been just that time with her. That would have been such a waste. My body would feel great. Like you said, the day of the day after. And then after that, I'd forget the movement patterns we've been creating. But my dad, we would come home and literally every night ish, I mean, give or take a few nights a week, but mm -hmm. we would be working to perfect the new drill we learned that I did not perfect at the, at the lesson. Let's say I learned a brand new drill, the hop back drill. You and I love this one. Mm -hmm. If I only do it when I'm with my coach, what a waste. Cause if I was taught, and by the way, that's showing that like, I don't, um, respect my coach enough to want to come back and show her or him what I did to prepare and show her. I couldn't wait for the next week to show her that I worked on this hot back drill. I couldn't wait to show her that I have been working on this thing and I'm proud of the work that I'm doing and here, check it out. Like I got really good at this and I feel stronger and I feel more powerful. That only comes from training at home. That doesn't come from just going one week to her and then the next week, we're probably going to have to do the same thing over again because my body doesn't remember how to do it. And you're going to find the most minimal growth if you don't work on the things that you're learning, especially with your hitting coach. Yeah. I mean, I, for anybody who's listening, I, I want you guys to understand when we, when we talk about our own experiences, this is not a, Hey, you should be like us talk. This is a, we've learned the hard way. We had to go through it. Sometimes you understand the lesson the next day. Sometimes it takes months or years to understand the lesson that you went through. And that's our job is to share those experiences so that hopefully you don't have to go through the same thing. Or if you do, you can be enlightened sooner than we were. Mm -hmm. And I was a sophomore in high school when this happened. It, I was all section. I was second team all state. I batted 420 my sophomore year. And after the season, I specifically remember my dad coming up to me and going, you didn't have a very good year. And I'm going, what are you talking about? I hit 420. And he says, no, it wasn't the, the results. You didn't work the same way this year that you did during the off season, which is true. When I think back on it at the time, yeah, you know what? I, I wasn't hitting every night. I was just kind of relying on my natural ability. And it all came back to bite me when I started my summer season that year. And I started out one for 33. Mm. And that's when I got with my hitting coach four straight days and made a vow based on myself that I would never go an, a, another day without hitting. And I really don't think I ever did until the day I retired um, yeah. because I was so afraid to lose the feelings and the swing that I had created. Do you think you needed that moment of one for 33 to truly have the motivation to hit every day though? A thousand percent. Yeah. I talk with my athletes all the time. We will all get to a point, whether we're eight, 12, 16, where what we naturally do stops working mm -hmm. as a hitter, because at some point that pitcher gets to a point where he or she knows exactly what she's doing, exactly what he or she is trying to accomplish. And they will beat us. And so what we naturally used to do, how we naturally used to just get the bat to the ball, doesn't work anymore. And the problem with that is that we never knew what we were doing in the first place. <laughs> so that's why we seek out help. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I feel like there are times where an eight, nine or 10 year old 
figuring that out at eight, nine, 10 is way better than trying to figure it out at 16. Um, but I was 16 and it was, it was that, that moment of clarity for me. Absolutely. Yeah. Which is why I always emphasize a bad weekend is great data. Yeah. A strikeout is great data. And I'm going to get on some people right here and probably piss some people off and I'm fine with it. I can't tell you how many people are so proud of their kid for only striking out once that weekend or only striking out once in the past month. Because in my mind, I don't think she's being challenged enough. I would rather her strike out more and learn about herself more so that she can one, be humble and then want to put in the work throughout the week. Yeah. I literally worked with an athlete this morning and it was the toughest day for her. This is the toughest day we've ever had together. And her dad texted me afterwards and goes, thanks for, thanks for pushing her. It's been a little bit of an easy ride lately for her. Mm-hmm. And she needed that. So strikeouts are not the end all be all. Like, as long as you look at it as something that, hey, I just learned a lot about myself. Like, hey, the high and inside pitch right now, I need to figure out how to get there. What better motivation than struggling, in my opinion? We need to look at it that way. Yeah. Yeah. So don't brag about not striking out. Like you need to strike out. It's life. The best do it. The best do it often. They just make adjustments sooner. Yeah. The goal is to do it. The goal is to learn from it. And everything is inventory, no matter what. Mm -hmm. And so we have good inventory. We have bad inventory. And so the idea is that when you take that inventory, if it was, if you had good results, you still take the inventory, repeat the process, keep going. But if, it, if something was wrong, again, to your point, a change has to be made. And you, a lot of times change is uncomfortable. Uh, and the first thing we have to realize is, you know, our, our training coaches, our hitting coaches um, are a lot of times going to be the mirror that we don't want to look into. Yeah. Because they expose our flaws. And, all, and so the whole idea is that if your hitting coach is as good as as they are, and which is why you are with them, they can point out those flaws, but they're also there to help you get better at it. Mm -hmm. We all have had coaches who tell us everything we do wrong and have no idea how to help us fix it. Yeah. That's straight up criticism at that point. Yeah. Yeah, totally. All right. I think we nailed, we nailed the first myth. You need to train more than once a week to find the progress that you deserve Mm -hmm. (laughs) and that you want. All right. Myth number two, power only equates to home runs. This was yours and I loved it. So you got to start us off with it. Yeah. I mean, look, major league baseball, women's college world series, home runs are prevalent They're They get all the, all the coverage. It doesn't mean that we all have that inside of us at the moment. Mm -hmm. And so I think what happens is whether it's my little leaguers or middle school or high school, whatever it is, they equate power as only a home run. And if I can't hit the ball over the fence, well, I don't have power and it's not good enough and I'm not going to get noticed. No, that's not true at all. Everybody has a power potential. It's your job to find out what your power potential is. And it's all relative at that point. It's no different than speed. I was not fast. I could get faster. That was my job to get faster. So if I ran a 7260, I had to run a 7060. Was I ever going to run a 66? No, not possible. So are there players out there who might hit a home run by chance if everything goes perfect? Yes. But your power potential is relative to who you are in that moment. So can you hit four doubles in a game? Yes, do it. That's way cooler than one home run and three strikeouts. Absolutely. And so, but not to anybody else. No, of course not. And I think that's where we have to separate what gets coverage from what's going to play. Mm -hmm. Yes. Don't get me wrong. It was amazing to watch Oklahoma hit the ball that way, but that's why it's Oklahoma. And they also had defense to back it up. Yeah. It was like, and you know, but again, if, Okay, so if I'm waiting for the one home run or if I have four or five players in a row who can bang doubles, it's all the same at that point. Mm -hmm. 
And so it's about understanding that power is relative. Power is based off of what you have the potential to do. So take your best swing, find out what your power potential is, and then work to do that as often as possible. You will get seen. It will show. I cannot deny somebody going three for four with three doubles. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what's cool too? It's like, if you focus on what you're good at, like I would say I'm a double sitter. I love hitting doubles. I love screaming it into gaps. And in pursuit of that was when my home runs came. Yeah. I never once held the bat in my hand. Actually, I lied. There was one time I wanted to hit a home run. I did. And I, there's a backstory to it, but I'll explain it in a second. But in pursuit of hitting it as hard as I possibly could into the gaps, that's how it went over the fence. Yeah. Because I set myself up to hit that line drive, which led to it. Um, now I mean, that if one, we're being honest, if ahead. we're being honest, a home run is just a double that goes over a fence. Totally. Those are my best home run, My favorite home runs were the like the shooter line drives that like you don't even know if it was going to go over, but it like found its way over, and you're like, yeah. how did that just happen? Those are those are fun. Now the one time, and I gotta say it, the one time I did focus on hitting a home run, we were at I think it was like Coastal Carolina. And their entire football team was sitting in the stands and um, they were like cackling the whole time. Cackling. I don't even know what, what word to use. And I remember going up to bat and I'm like, I'll show them, you know, and I, just, and I just like, and I focus on just hitting it hard, you know, and it went over. And then my next at bat, literally, they're like, you won't do it again. And literally in my mind, I'm like, I love when people doubt me. It's my favorite thing. So I literally just like, chuckle and I'm like okay screamed it over right center like they they literally were like what um that was the only time I really just wanted to hit the crap out of it over the fence and it worked out in my favor but I can't I can't always have that mentality or I'm gonna come up short more often than not like you have I feel like there's like one right moment and that was probably the one but um yeah I think, I think having a home run mentality up to bat is you're just, you're just waiting to hit a pop-up in my opinion. Yeah. Every time. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think it's, there's, there's definitely going to be a shift and there. I think it's already started that, you know, consistent, hard contact plays and it will play. Yeah. And so as, as a hitter, that's my goal. If I get 10 swings, eight better be what they should be. Yep. Yep. I like that. Now, I don't think that the, the myth of power only equates to home runs. I don't think it really comes from the kids. I think sometimes it comes from coaches or parents only praising the home run or sure. praising that more than the double or whatever. I think they – to keep it the way it should, everything should be praised the same way. Now, if it's your first home run and like, that's a pretty exciting moment. Yeah. But we should be treating the sack bunt. We should be treating the single RBI, the double. Like we should be treating all of those things like they're amazing because they are. Like we should keep it the same. Don't you, don't you agree? Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, we are training to perform. Mm -hmm. Being able to take your training to practice, practice to the game should be first and foremost, the thing that we praise the most. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure you deal with it just as much as I do. The ability to have kids relax when they're in the batter's box, knowing that there already is enough pressure to perform without changing anything in their mind I just dealt with it, a kid who was here just before in practice with me, training with me, we go to the field. He practices with his team. He hits the ball hard. And then he goes into the game and tries to do extra, tries to do more front foot flies open, front shoulder flies out, head comes off the ball, misses the pitch. He's supposed to put in play ultimately leads to strikeouts. The last 10% as a hitter is, is your job to mm -hmm. take all you've done, relax, be able to focus and work process forward, not result backwards. Mm. Process forward, not result backwards. I love that. 
I've never heard you say that. We've talked for a year. <laughs> I just came up with it like three days ago. I love it. That's so good. And this is why I'm totally going to throw this in here. Journaling is so key. Yes. And just understanding what things feel like is key. Because when you see an athlete trust their stuff and look confident and look like they're going to crush the ball, all they're doing is doing what they did in practice. And yeah in that practice, in that training session, knowing what went on to create the great hits in that trait, in that process, in that practice, that's how it equates as well. So if you can exactly. get those feelings and those thoughts and the, like, when I say feelings, it's not like happy, sad. It's no, it's how did my hips turn? Did mm -hmm. my hands come first? Did they come second? Did I stand up? Like, where was I? What was I doing on my best way? And being able to take that moment and put it into your bat and games that requires some little like self-reflection, yeah. which can be done in a hitting journal or a notebook. That's a, and that's how we separate ourselves by being different, doing different things. J sitting down for 10 minutes every night and journaling. I'll say it, it's not normal. Mm -mm. It's rare. And so if you want to go to different places, you have to be different. Absolutely. All right, we debunked the second myth. Power only equates to home runs. Yeah, right. All right, third myth. Actually, we talked about this one to combine it. Maybe we should add that. Okay, time out. Have to look back at this. <laughs> you mentioned something as well with this one. You need to swing up through the ball to create a good launch angle. This was mm -hmm. another myth that we have come up with. Yeah. We shouldn't be swinging up through the ball. I'm a firm believer that if everything works the way that it's supposed to, if you're sequencing your swing from the ground up, if you're getting your back knee down, if you're creating tilt with your body because your shoulders have rotated, you have the way that they're supposed to. If your hands are above the barrel, you will naturally swing up through the ball. That's the natural swing path. Mm -hmm. If I'm in bad body positions and then I just try to swing up through the ball, I'm creating an in and out of the zone swing. Instead of my bat being as flat as it can possibly be, it's now going to be vertical. So mm -hmm. now everything has to be perfect. In a, in a game where I'm already going to fail if everything goes right, I can't be in bad position. I can't be in bad mindsets. I can't have bad visualization and think that I'm going to be able to be successful. Yeah. And so the idea of swing up, a lot of kids don't have that mind body connection yet to understand that. Yeah. You know what? Technically you probably could think about it, but it has to be a split second before the ball. Mm -hmm. It has to be, make sure that if I am going to do that, then my extension has to be perfectly into that opposite field gap. Again, too many things have to go right to be able to be in bad positions and still have a good result. So I always want to focus more on good body positions, sequencing, working from the ground up, making consistent contact. Because I do believe there's two parts of the swing. How do I get to the ball and then have to, how do I explode through the ball? So how do I get there? How do I extend? Um, and so if, if that's happening the right way at the right time, the trajectory of the ball will be what it's supposed to be. You explain this so beautifully. I just want to tell you that. Thank you. It's so good because as soon as you tell an athlete from a coach's perspective, Hey, swing up through it, they're going to stand up. They're mm -hmm. going to throw their hands up and they're going to wonder why half of their balls are either going straight into the ground because right. they're just topping it or it's going straight into the sky mm -hmm. because that's where their power is going. Right. But in reality, that power needs to be linear. But mm -hmm. as like you said, that movement pattern happens and those on YouTube that get to watch this video can see us moving right now. You're naturally going to get through it. That's what the extension is. Mm-hmm. And of course, there's some balls where like you getting on top of it requires you to kind of come down through it and create that spin to make it a line drive. But right. 
it does it has everything to do with working from the ground up yep 100 percent. now for those that don't understand what working from the ground up is can and you described it a, a little bit earlier but take us through the ground up and how we can create that as hitters because you because you explain it so beautifully so when you talk about sequence it's really the order of events and so the order of events for me is front foot strides back foot turns and i like to really be specific i really like to think about taking my heel to the catcher to mm -hmm. create that turn back knee goes down towards the plate back hip starts to come through front side starts to get locked out and so now i've worked from the ground up so all my lower half has done what it's supposed to it's created that turn it's created that space now for my back elbow to come into my rib cage my hands start to get out in front and the way i like to think about it is my my barrel and my knot my my hands and my knob are all in the head of my barrel. Mm -hmm. I want to keep that as long as I possibly can. That creates the strongest contact point. So now if you can picture it, my back knee is down, my front leg is locked out. And because of that solid base that I'm in, I naturally already have a tilt with my upper body. Mm -hmm. And I'm tilting with my upper body all while creating space. And what I've seemed to find is one of the biggest flaws once we do get to contact is not extending through the opposite field as well as we can. What happens to a lot of players is they keep that back elbow tucked into their rib cage and they let their torso continue to rotate. And that's why we see a lot of players come off the ball, pull off the ball. So I like to think well, when I'm at contact, every other body part has stopped, it's frozen, it's stable. And now my back elbow is driving out through the big part of the field. And so at that moment, I want to think that my bat and the ball are connected the whole time. Mm. And so in that moment, that's when I create my angle to where I want the ball to go. I've seen you do it plenty of times with that dog ball launcher thing the chuck it <laughs> the chuck it um if i take my hands and my elbows and the bat and i send it out in whatever direction i want it to go that's where the ball is going to go mm. that's so i never thought of it that way that the barrel and the ball are connected i've always been told to have the barrel in the zone for as long as possible so sure. like as you're in this position um, where your hands are almost like connected to your back shoulder, the barrel's in the zone already yep. and it's got to stay in that flat zone to and through it. Mm -hmm. But I've never thought about them as connected. And I really like that. That makes me think of that. Um, I think there's a device where there's like a string that you set up from like behind you and then in front of you and there's like a wiffle ball on it. So it's yeah, basically it like the out. plane of the ball. Yeah. So yeah. you're supposed to, um, you know, drive it up the middle. And mm -hmm. if you hit the, the wire or you come up under it, like it tells you, you weren't in the zone early enough. Right. Um, that's, that's a really, really nice way to say that. I like that a lot. You know, honestly, this, this tells you how far removed I am from the game. No, I'm not going to the AU tryouts to all those people think, thinking I'm coming back to play. No. Um, basically doing the chuck it drill with my athletes has proven to me that I have a long way to go if I ever came back into this game. Um, and chuck it is not sponsoring us for this podcast interview, but I'm telling you the, the chuck it, the dog toy can truly help you with that barrel and knowing where to snap it. Um, yeah. I mean, direction, direction is one of the biggest things um and i don't think a lot of people talk about it because i don't think they know how to explain it um and direction is just it's huge i mean it, it, when 75 to 80 percent of the pitches that we are going to swing at are middle away i have to know that my barrel direction is going where it needs to go otherwise if the only pitch I can hit is, is inside corner, well, chances are of me even keeping that ball fair are not very high. Right. 
Agreed. Agreed. All right, we debunked that one too. All right, what about this myth? Hitting coaches are all the same. They're not all the same. I mean, I can speak from experience. Um, for those who didn't listen to the first podcast, I've been battling cancer for four and a half years. Not all doctors are the same. So in a world where we deem ourselves from professionals, uh, um, a lot of times I wait for somebody else to tell me I'm a professional before I tell myself that I'm a professional because it's, it's going to come from a place that I'm doing what I need to be doing and I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing for people to see results, not just in the cage, outside the cage too. There's so much more that goes into this. We are not just helping create good baseball and softball players. I think we do take it upon ourselves to understand that we are creating good human beings as well. And so it's being all those things that they need. They, we can be a confidant to them. We can be their trainer. We can push them. We can hold them accountable. We can empathize with them. We can sympathize with them. I've come across too many hitting coaches who just stop at hitting and forget that there's a human element to all of this. Yeah. And so to think that all hitting coaches are created the same, if that was the case, so many of my clients wouldn't be my clients right now mm -hmm. because they came to me because they mm -hmm. heard that I am available at any time to talk on the phone, text message, create, you know, an environment where kids really feel comfortable no matter what to be able to share what they're going through, because I know that what they're going through outside the cage will directly impact the work that we do together inside the cage. And so to think that every hitting coach is created equal, um, I think the bad hitting coach is the ones who came up with that saying. <laughs> that myth. Um, that's so well said. I can't tell you when I, how many people, when I first started coaching, how they were honest in saying they came to me because I was a little bit cheaper than, you know, somebody else. And I was brand new to coaching. So I didn't take it as an insult. I'm like, I get it. I'm new at this. But now I think about it and I'm like, too many people are trying to go to the cheap coach. And, you know, there are some coaches that basically charge nothing for a lesson and they are absolutely incredible at what they do. I don't know how they build a business or how they make money, but maybe it, they be, they're not about the money. But the majority of the coaches, and my dad could probably say this too, when I was hitting with this hitting coach, we were traveling two hours, it was not cheap to meet with her. But we were learning things that other coaches probably weren't going to teach me. So then it was worth it. Like mm -hmm. you have to invest most of the time, like unless you get the diamond in the rough, it is, you have to invest in somebody that is close or is a professional that, that has either been there or they know how to connect with the athlete and get the most out of them. Like you said, too many coaches are just hitting. They don't care about the kid. They don't care mm -hmm. about their mind. They don't care about the fact that that kid might be going through something that they need to talk about. And that's what's holding them back. It's not the swing. But I think that, I'm just going to say, you and I are kind of rare. <laughs> and I think we're rare because in a weird way, we kind of self-impose our own continuing education classes on ourselves. Yeah. We know that it's always evolving. And so if if I've been teaching something a certain way, why not have it in my toolbox to be able to say it five different ways? If we know that all kids don't learn the same, well, I need to have as many phrases, sayings, connectors in my toolbox as I can. Mm -hmm. And that's why I always say, if I have 10 kids in front of me and I only know how to say it one way and I only have one philosophy, you're going to help one kid. I'm going to help one or two kids. And the yeah. other eight kids are, are out of luck. No, that's not why I do this. That's not we're why we do this. We're yeah, always learning. We're always learning. 
And I really do think that the, the people who I have the most respect for are the first to want to have a conversation, want to collaborate, want to have a, uh, whether it's a free hitting session or something, a, a conversation. Yeah, I'll hop on the phone with you in a heartbeat to be able to know, hey, what works for you? What can I take away from that? What's made you successful? What are some of the faults that you have? And constantly understand that this is, we are, we are evolving as human beings anyway. Mm -hmm. My profession is no different than me as a family man, me as a husband, me as a, a son, me as a father. Yeah. I think also I have massive respect for people and coaches and just people in general that aren't afraid to say that they screwed up. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm sure you have said things that you didn't want to say or that you didn't mean to say a certain way and was portrayed in a certain way. Totally. We all have this, but the people that do it and they say, oh, it wasn't me, it was you. I, ugh. let's talk about a whole nother episode I want to do on the podcast. I'm going to say this right now. If you're being coached, your athlete is being coached by someone who is always right and they're never wrong, get the heck out because 100%. that's how a kid feels inferior instead of equal to their coach. They want to be on the same page. They need to be with somebody that gets the most out of them. And someone like that is only going to scare them. And, that, and then they're probably going to want to quit because they have a coach breathing down their neck and they don't want to, they don't want to mess up in front of them instead of treat your session in the cage as like, it's time to experiment, it's time to explore, it's time to screw up and learn how to make an adjustment. Like, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm never, I mean, there every day I learn something new from, a, from an athlete. And every day I'm, I'm screwing up in some sort of a way, but I need that. Like I need that, or I'm just gonna be the same coach forever and ever, amen, and I don't wanna be that, I wanna be better. And I think, that is what I'll have for the rest of my life. I want to be like that. I've told you before, I'm like, I'm going to be given lessons in person until I'm 95 because 100%. I love it. I love learning things. I love being wrong. Like I've been working with some kids for four, almost five years now. And there are things that new things that I'm introducing to them that actually it was almost counterintuitive. The first time we met, I was saying things like, um, shoot, I can't even give it a prime example, but once I learned the heel down drill, which is like one of the core drills that I'm teaching now, it, it has made me eliminate so many drills that I used to teach because when you could find one drill that kind of works a lot of different things, I'm like, screw sure. the other one, screw the thing I used to spend, you know, hours with, with kids. No, this one's better. And I think that's how I continue to try to show up for my kids. But this isn't about us trying to gloat this is literally just i think us just talking about what works and where we're finding the most results well i also think that there's so many coaches out there who they do gloat and you know a lot of times it's a highlight reel look what my player did look what my player did look mm -hmm. what my guy did look what my guy did look what my girl did great where are the strikeouts? Where's the strikeout with the bases loaded? Where's mm -hmm. the pop-up with the bases loaded? Is she not your girl at that point? Is she not your guy at that point? So if the idea is continuously progressing and developing, each experience is just that. It's, an, it's a solid, single opportunity to either take what you've learned and perform and have success or failure. But each opportunity is just that. It's like flipping a coin. I can get heads 10 times in a row. I still have a 50-50 chance on the 11th time. So it's no different than my strikeouts or I could be 10 for 10 with 10 hits. The next opportunity, if I don't take the same approach, the same idea and understand that it's process forward, I could look just as bad on that 11th as, I, as good as I did on the 10th. Amen. I love this. I love that everybody gets to hear our conversations we have every week. Um, okay, one more myth we got to debunk just because 
this one will stir the pot a little bit. A baseball and softball swing are different. Mm -hmm. They're not at all. And I actually say this a lot of times because of softball, because of how close it is and in relativeness, they're throwing gas. I truly believe that you actually have less margin of, of error in softball than you do in baseball. There's yeah. a lot of baseball swings that have some pretty big flaws, but because they've just understand and how to get the barrel to the ball, they can kind of get away with it. Um, I don't see that happening in softball very much. Mm -mm. Just the, how hard the pitch is thrown, the movement on the pitch, depending on the spin, like it's almost like hitting a bowling ball sometimes. So mm -hmm. if things, if you are not in a good position and you are not in a stable position and that bad head is not out in front of you, it's it's really hard. Yeah. And okay. we've seen so, some like insane things. Like I'm thinking of Jesse Warren the other day hit a ball, like literally an inch off the ground over the fence. Mm -hmm. And like, none of that was picture perfect, but she's that good. Yeah. And she has that good barrel control to make, you know, to make that type of thing happen. If a even high schooler right now try to do that, like, no. <laughs> good luck. There's also another home run I remember, I think Bailey Hempel, or no, I don't remember who hit it, but it was in the Women's College World Series and it looked like she, no, she played for Texas. She just like barely touched it mm -hmm. and it went over. And yeah. it was like, that's amazing. And but that's like, what and that's what you again. see. So I, that's why so many times I love the side views. I don't, I don't really care like where the ball goes because right. I wanna see the similarities in the swings. If I know it was a good swing, I want to see the similarities. I want to look side by side. I want to break it down. I want to see, you know, where were they body position wise? Were they a little bit out in front, but they were in a really good position. They were able to explode the bat head through the ball. Those are the things that I want to see. Mm -hmm. And when you take a great softball swing and a great baseball swing, they look exactly the same. Mm hmm I know there was a side-by-side -side that they did with um, a pro softball player. She played in the NPF for a while. Um, Sandberg. I can't remember her first name. Kristen Sandberg. And some hitter from the MLB. I don't know. And they showed their contact point. It was literally the same exact thing. Mm -hmm. Locked out front leg, knee um, underneath their head, driving from their back, like their big toes and their heel was up in their back. Like, there were just so many similarities and that's the thing i know i know for a fact males have a stronger upper body like it's 100%. just genetics which like you're saying they can get away with more mm -hmm. of just you know just throwing your hands mm -hmm. um but that's the thing like the synchronization of the swing working from the ground up like all of those elements are similar right yeah, we could probably do a whole episode on just the similarities between the two, but we need to make sure these people don't, you know, start sleeping on us because <laughs> we get into this stuff. Um, but I think that was a really good, good explanation of like how they really aren't different. No. Just our bodies are a little different and men the, and women can get away with different things. The golf swing's not different. Yeah. All swings look different. But the a contact male, point's the same. Yeah. Uh, a, a female hockey player and a male hockey player, their slap shots are not different. Tennis players, are their swing's not different. Like, it's, again, it's, we talk about this all the time, right? Confirmation bias. Meaning, I can find anything today to confirm whatever bias I want to throw in your face. Mm -hmm. So, unless somebody is there to call me out on my BS... I can tell you a baseball swing is different than a softball swing because that's all I know how to teach. Which goes back to our other myth that not all hitting coaches are the same. We should also say that a male doesn't only have to coach a male and a no. female can coach a male. I no. can get into that. There was somebody I respected that was a baseball coach that told me I shouldn't be working with any males. And I'm like, but they want to work with me. So what, what's up here? Right. Um, 
man, wow, this is good stuff. Uh, there are like a million other questions that I want to ask, but I want to be conscious of your time. So let's do our five for thrive rapid fire. Cool. Are you ready for this? Yeah. Um, actually, before we do it, how can people follow you? Um, if anybody wants to learn a little bit more about Chris's story of overcoming cancer and how that helped him, um, do some pretty awesome things with his own swing, the massive adversity that he's gone through, you can head out, head to his episode. It's in the show notes called overcoming adversity with former pro baseball player, Chris Basami. Um, but how can, how can people follow you if they're like super into how you teach hitting? You can follow me on Instagram at Chris, C-H-R-I-S, Basami, V as in Victor, A-S-A-M-I. You can uh, go to my website, VasamiTraining.com. Uh, feel free to reach out to me. I believe you can email me. You, there, I think my cell phone's on my website. Um, I've said this plenty of times. When it comes to all of this stuff, on and off the field, whatever it may be, I'm an open book. So please, um, if you are looking for some good conversation, please reach out. I can't wait for our next conversation so we can debunk all of, all the other myths about hitting. Um, those all will be in the show notes as well. So you can check those out along with other episodes of the podcast, similar to this one. We both nerd out about hitting, so we could talk about it for hours, which means you just have to, you'll just have to be on again. That's happening. Um, all right. Five to thrive. You ready? Yes. Let's do this. Who's your current favorite hitter and why right now? Current favorite hitter. I would say I really enjoy watching Tatis hit. Um, I think he's somebody who knows exactly who he is as a hitter. Um, he, in the off season, he really worked on staying through the ball uh, and really driving the ball the other way. And it's really showing now. I mean, he's just the amount of doubles he hits is the amount of slugging percentage. Um, but at the same time, you can watch him actually take a two strike approach at the same time. Um, he's just fun. He's fun to watch. There's just a lot of pride um, that he exudes when he's hitting. They say the more you know yourself, the better you'll be. So that's cool that you can also see that. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, are your daughters going to play softball? I want to know this. They will be given the opportunity. Um, I am not going to force anything on them and no matter what activity uh my my oldest daughter laney actually just started gymnastics and um she didn't want to leave the other day so um what i will do is that whatever they decide to do um they will not be training once a week <laughs> so well said that's good all right and hopefully one day i get to work with them if they want to play a softball Okay. Absolutely. All right. Home run with no one out or no one on or no one out or game winning single. Game winning single. I figured you'd say that. Perfect answer. Will you be watching Team USA play in the Olympics in a couple weeks? Absolutely. Um, I, oh, I mean, it's always hard when the Olympics are over in Asia because mm -hmm. everything happens 12 hours before us here. And so like not being able to watch it live is always hard because all the news outlets and media outlets are always telling you the results before they happen. But mm -hmm. long story short, yes, absolutely. Why? Why are you going to watch softball? Why would you do that? I love competition. <laughs> I really do. And so to watch these women compete at the level that they do, especially knowing how hard they work, and the pride that they take in doing it, it's way fun. There's just too much to learn. There's too much to watch. There's too much to see. I'm with you. Any sport that's competitive and seeing either males or females do their thing, I, I enjoy it so much. I'm pumped for the Olympics. And spoiler alert to any listeners, we're going to do a podcast episode with all of the Olympians we've had on the podcast. We've had four and there will be one another one coming up soon. Um, but I get really excited about it because that was my dream growing up was to be an Olympian. Um, and now being able to see these athletes, not just playing college, play pro, but now they get to actually represent our country. Like I'm going to be watching every single game and I might just watch it live. What the heck? 
it's the same week as my wedding. So what else do I have to do? Um, last and final question. What has been your proudest dad moment? Um, just, I think watching them develop and turn into little human beings. Um, you know, seeing the pure joy that we have as human beings that doesn't get disrupted by becoming older or an adult. Um, just them literally waking up and knowing that you are coming into their room in the morning to say good morning and the, the look on their face of just pure joy. It's, it lets you know, you know, why we do it. You're doing something right. <laughs> I love it. Well, Chris, I want to acknowledge you for all the work that you've done and put into your own athletes and that you've shared on this podcast to help other people understand this game a little bit better and come out with a lot more knowledge. I know every time I talk to you, I am a smarter human being. So I appreciate you so much for coming on the show again. Um, the, uh, to become a, uh, a better human being myself. I love it. All right, man. We'll have to have you on soon.